now donate their brains, but like a, like an owner of a painting would donate, would request a painting to a museum while still having it in their home. And so there is, there is 300 people in San Diego walking around with a, with a card that says if something happens to me, I want my brain to be preserved by the Brain Observatory in the Digital Brain Library. We have donors of, uh, of different ages. I think our youngest donor is in, in she's in the, her 20s, early 20s, and our oldest is 103. And they're both both blessed with a with a beautifully working mind. So, but on the other hand, we also have less fortunate uh, individuals who participate, and those are the ones. These are the patients that decide to donate their brain often when they're in hospice care, often when they know their illness is terminal, and they donate their brain because they want to help other patients. So even if uh, there's no treatment available for them at this point in time, they hope that by donating their brains, we will be able to, to improve uh, treatment or to find the right treatment for patients to come. And this is, this is therefore what the Brain Library really is. It's a, it's a kind of a matchmaking for um, between patients who we're working with now and those patients in the future. So that a doctor, say 20 years from now, will be able to look for a match. Now, if you think about future, you know, imagine minority report type of scenario where the doctor will select cases that best match his, his patient now. And because these people have donated their brains maybe 20 years ago, and the brain of the patient he's seeing now, of course, is in the head and you don't want to remove it. Uh, the whole point is that they're still, they're, they're in fact, uh, you know, prolong their life. But these matches will actually inform this doctor uh, on what to do because then he'll be able to zoom in at the microscopic level and really look at the phenomena that are happening. In fact, already what we're doing now helps uh, clinically because we can provide already a correlation between MR images and pathology. So already we're explaining because after 30 years of MRI, pretty much, you know, now we're asking ourselves, but can MRI, what does really MRI sees in the brain? And these are answers we can already give by, even with the few, relatively few cases that we have examined. Because where there is a bright spot in an MRI, we can exactly understand what was happening in the tissue that created that, what they call technically hyperintensity, which just means brightness in an MRI, when in reality it should be dark in an MRI image. If, if a multiple sclerosis, many patches of bright areas in the brain of these patients, what are the inflammation? Is there a disruption in the axons? And we can already answer those questions. The reality is that you know, when, a, when a brain donor passes away, uh, there is a process that needs to occur very quickly. And what happens is that the, eventually the, the person comes to our laboratories and we, we extract the brain. And that's the moment that I think is really the cathartic moment of this project because the person becomes a brain. And so you're left wondering, is, is this person still here? Or is there anything here that really uh, has to do with, with this person? Or are the two now completely disjointed? So a short term, clinical value, long term, more visionary, and hopefully we'll, we'll achieve that. And that's why we know, if I look at brains now that I have in the lab, I know who's the painter, I know who's the writer, we have a Nobel laureate, we have, you know, so I know who they are, and, and I think it builds gradually a, a more of a, uh, this collection w could answer many questions that we, we cannot answer now in terms of what makes us who we are.